Just as the eruption transformed the mountain's landscape, an easy walk from your car can transform your Mount St. Helens experience. If you want to get away from the cars and the crowds, then the Mount Margaret backcountry might be the place for you to go. It's the only place on the north side of the mountain where overnight backcountry camping is allowed. There's limited spaces. First one's about four miles in. Well, you recognize that guy, Chief Meteorologist Matt Savino. You've been talking about Mount St. Helens for a few years. A little bit. And you know what? I've been back to the Mount, St. Uh, Mount Margaret uh, Wilderness since then, and it's amazing. It's beautiful. So it's a great place to go backpacking and to camp. So. All right, I'm going to start you out, Blair, with an image of the eruption. Um, and we've seen a lot of images of the eruption. The pieces you had before this were just amazing, just fascinating. But this one is interesting for several reasons. It shows the obviously the, the eruptive plume here, but notice the edge here, and that's to the south and west because the upper level winds were out of the southwest, pushing that plume, and boy, doesn't that look ominous, to the north and to the east. And there was heavy, heavy ash fall on Mount Adams. I believe that's where this picture was taken. And, and then downwind all the way up through Spokane. Now, this is a series of satellite images showing the eruption. The first one, within about an hour of the eruption, you can see the clearing that happened around the mountain. Then as you go through time, you begin to see that circle widen and get broader as it expanded and covered out through eastern Washington here and eventually not only through eastern Washington, but to the eastern United States. This is an image put together uh, from NOAA, the Air Resources Laboratory, and each of these lines, I know it's pretty primitive, but this is from a study way back in the 80s. Hmm. Um, and it's kind of fun to look at the old it ones. It is super so, cool, yeah. Yeah, so this line, that's the ash plume at an elevation of three kilometers, which is a little bit less than two miles up. The other one here, though, this outer one, that's 16 kilometers up, that's 10 miles up. That's basically the entire, that's up into the stratosphere, basically, okay? Mm -hmm. Super high. And look at that, Blair. It goes all the way out to the east coast. My gosh. Which is amazing. That's and, crazy. And you, you might think that, hey, this probably had an impact on world climate. Other eruptions have done that. But here's a little perspective on volcanoes and volcanic eruptions in recent history. Now, I know this is a little bit hard to read, but basically look at it this way. It's, uh, the bigger the orange bar here, the more stuff is called ejecta that the volcano put into the atmosphere. It's in cubic miles. What's a cubic mile? Think a box about a box that's a mile long, a mile wide, and a mile high. A very, very large box, a very, very <laughs> large volume. So the first one on the map here, 5000 BC, was right here in Oregon, Mount Mazama, now known as Crater Lake. That put about 10 cubic miles of stuff into the atmosphere. That totally impacted world climate, right? But look, Mount St. Helens shows up not once, but several times. Hmm. This is back 1900 BC, not nearly as big, about a cubic mile. And then in 1480 to 1482, a little bit less than that. And as we go up the list, you see some of the other big volcanic eruptions in more modern history, Tambora in Indonesia and Krakatoa in 1883 has been well studied. That one, the sonic boom from Krakatoa was heard over a thousand miles away in Australia and it sent waves around the globe. They had waves in the English Channel from the eruption of Krakatoa in the Pacific. It's just amazing. So we go to our most recent eruption of Mount St. Helens, and it's pretty tiny. It oh, was wow. only, right, only a third of a cubic mile of ejecta or stuff that it put into the atmosphere or about 30 times less than what Mount Mazama did when interrupted. Now, Dr. Cliff Massa, University of Washington and another researcher named Alan Roback did a study on the short term weather effects of that eruption and they found not a surprise that it cooled the daytime temperatures, but a little bit surprisingly, it didn't just limit the cooling at night. It actually warmed at night immediately downstream of the eruption for a day or two because you're getting reflectivity from all those volcanic particles actually adding heat to the atmosphere. It's pretty amazing stuff. All right, Matt, thanks so much. So yeah. interesting. We're back after this.